So it's now my pleasure to welcome to the stage Shan Cooper, who will introduce our program today. Shan? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Our program today is Leading Through Change and Responding to Opportunity. And I can tell you there's no better leader than to have this conversation with us today than Kim Green. I've had the pleasure and the honor of serving and working for Kim uh, during my tenure in the Georgia Power Board and just being associated with the company. And she is second to none when it comes to leadership. She is a talent magnet. You talk to people who work with her and have worked with her in the past, uh, and they're just on a high to have the honor of working with Kim. I love her because she is a visionary. She is a just wicked smart, and she's strong, and she's solid, and she knows this industry. But in the industry, if you guys know and follow the, ener the energy industry, you know there is lots of change that has occurred over the past few decades. Kim's career spans about 33 years, and so she's seen it all and probably led through it all and done it all. And so I'm delighted to have her join me on stage uh, to, to share with us today. As she comes, I do want to talk a little bit about the things we probably may not talk about today. In addition to serving and leading Georgia Power and all that she does in the community, Kim also serves on the board of Valera Corporation. Uh, she also serves in community. Uh, she is on the boards of the Metro Chamber. She's a curator for the Georgia uh, Historical Society. She's on the board at the Woodruff Art Center. Uh, Kim, I don't know how you do it all, but you seem to say yes to a lot. She's been recognized also for her service and for her giving. And so, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Kim Green. Shan, I'm just trying to keep up with you. Oh, my gosh. Thank oh my you gosh. very much. I'm trying to keep up with me, too, Kim. Somebody help me. Um, <laughs> But I'm so excited and so honored to be with you. Kim and I, we laugh a lot. She's, we work hard, though, don't we? But we, we laugh a lot. We love our customers. And here you are today, Kim, President, CEO, Chairman of Georgia Power. That's a lot. Did you wake up as a little girl saying, I want to be the CEO of a power or company? Tell us about your journey. No, I did not. And um, even when I started working at Southern Company, I, I really, in fact, this was on a little clip at WSB, I didn't even know who the CEO was or really even what that role meant at the time. So let me tell you a little bit about my background. <clears throat> I am from Knoxville, Tennessee, and I did go to the university in that city, um, which I try to keep on the lowdown, but I know Todd Gross will cheer for, with me. Um, yeah. <laughs> He's the only one. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. And um, went to engineering school, and I had wanted to study medicine because I wanted mm -hmm. to make people's lives better, and ended up moving to Birmingham, Alabama to get a master's degree in biomedical engineering. And um, <clears throat> I was just recently looking through my graduation program from my commencement, and I was reminded of the title of my thesis which is a biomechanical analysis of the role of the interosseous membrane in the essex lopresti fracture. I told you guys she was smart. So, no, I just had, I had a very uh, you know, big focus on what I wanted to do and had gone to get this um, additional education that was going to launch my career in designing artificial orthopedic implants. So... No, I had no idea. And in fact, I never took any power systems engineering classes. So the long story short is that life threw me a curveball like it often does. And that curveball is my husband of almost 35 years. But at the time, we were newly married when I graduated. And his lifelong dream was to be a pilot. And um, he had that lifelong dream longer than I had my lifelong dream. So I decided to put my dream on hold and find another job in Birmingham, Alabama. And Southern Company Services hired me. Southern Company Services, that's a subsidiary of ours, a, a shared services organization that's a sister of Georgia Power. And so remarkably, one of the very first projects that I worked on was designing equipment for Plant Vogel Units 1 and 2. And wow. so I learned very early in was, my career. It was, an omen. it was destiny. What do you guys think? Destiny? Yes. Well, it's just so <laughs> remarkable and really a wonderful full circle moment for me to have over 33 years ago 
walked the halls of what was then a brand new nuclear plant. Units one and two came online in 87 and 89. This was 1991. And I thought, wow, nuclear power is wonderful. It's clean, it's safe, it's reliable, it's affordable. We need more of it in the United States. I just didn't know it would take so long uh, to bring another one online. But anyway, I've had a wonderful career and I won't bore everybody with every part of it, but um, it's a wonderful privilege to be here right now. Wonderful, we're glad you're here as well. So Kim, you've been in the role now a little over a year. So how do you transition into something like a CEO chair? How do you transition into the role? So I have had a few opportunities to transition into things very differently. Mm -hmm. And it started probably when I came into the energy industry from the biomedical engine industry. And I recognized that even though in the beginning I was sure that I would not like working for the power company, that obviously was not the case. And during my career, I've had opportunities to do things that are very different, work in very different business units, and then ultimately lead. Uh, before I came to Georgia Power, I had the opportunity and privilege to uh, be the CEO of Southern Company Gas, which is a natural gas distribution company. And I didn't know anything about natural gas di distribution. So what I've learned over the years are, well, there's a lot to learn, but really sort of five words that I sort of think about when I'm transitioning. And it's five C words. And the first word is competence. And so what I really tried to do, uh, even though I knew a lot about the electric utility industry, I had to up my game and my competence. You're always learning. We are lifelong learners, all of us in this room. And so one thing I had never done was climb a power pole. And we have thousands of men and women who do that all the time. And I needed to appreciate what they do. And so I went to our training center and I put on hooks, which are those spikes, and I got myself somehow up a power pole <laughs> and um, you know, learned to do that. I spent time in bucket trucks and laying this, this rubber, this uh, protective gear on top of power system lines we call line hose, and it's really heavy. <laughs> I thought, they're not giving me a break up here at all. I am sweating bullets. And anyway, um, I want to experience what they do. So it's, it's building your competence, and it goes much gr broader than even what I'm talking about. But you've got to know something about what you're doing. That doesn't mean you have to be a subject matter expert, and everybody at Georgia Power knows more about what they do than I know. But I need to know a little bit about all of it and connect a lot of dots. Mm -hmm. So it's about competence. Number two, it's about communication. And you've got to over-communicate. And I have found so many times that I think I'm, that an answer to a question or that I'm communicating something very clearly. And then I hear somebody say it back to me and I realize that I must not have been that clear. Um, you've got to over-communicate and over-communicate. You've got to listen. Um, listen to a lot of people and that's really part about building your competence, but you've got to be able to communicate well across all parts of the organization, to the people on the front lines, to the people in the boardroom, and thank you, Shan, for your service on our board. Tommy Holder, thank you for being here. Um, so you've got to be able to communicate well, and the more competence you have, uh, the better able you are to communicate. You've got to collaborate. Nothing is done individually. And so you've got to be a good team player and you've got to know that when you're working with different organizations or you're trying to get something done, you're going to have to collaborate with the team. And so and our enterprise is actually quite a, um, a strong matrix organization. So again, I mentioned the Southern Company Services. That's another organization that houses a lot of our shared services. So we've got to collaborate across all parts of our business. Um, so those are the first three. Uh, competence, co communicate, collaborate. The fourth one is you've got to have a lot of courage. A lot of courage to make hard decisions, communicate hard messages, um, say that you don't know. I say I don't know a lot. I've got to um, ask a lot of questions, but I don't have all the answers, but I know how to go get them. 
So um, you know, one thing we did last year coming into Georgia Power is we um, saw that we were going to need to make some organizational changes and um, make some adjustments to our budgets, which meant ultimately that we had to, um, to separate with some people, which is a terrible thing to do. That doesn't happen that often in our business. But to come in and try to create a culture that um, of people who are excited about the future at the same time, communicating clearly that we're going to have to make some changes, that can be really hard. So you've got to have a lot of courage to speak the truth, be as open and transparent as you possibly can, and make decisions that are in the best interest of our customers and over the long term. And then lastly, the fifth word is care, C-A-R-E. And I just think that for any of us to be as successful as we want to be in the roles that we have and at the companies that we either own or that we have the privilege of working for, you have to truly care about your mission. And that's something I learned early on in my, uh, when I joined Southern Company. Um, I wanted to get into medicine because I wanted to make people's lives better. Well, electricity makes every person's life better. And without it, it's a pretty bad day. And our employees have such a mission focus on ensuring that the product that we provide, which in some cases can mean the difference between life or death, whether it's in a hospital or clean water or clean and safe medicine, clean food, safe food, um, during the hottest days of the year, the coldest day these days of the year, um, you know, our people shine. And it was during, I guess, Winter Storm Elliot a couple of years ago. You all might remember a really cold Christmas. Um, and I happened to be in Knoxville, Tennessee on that Christmas weekend. And I'm in my house cooking Christmas dinner and the lights go out. And I won't belabor it, but the long story short is there were rolling blackouts to the north of us, rolling blackouts to the east of us. People here in Georgia and at Southern Company were camped out. They were missing Christmas with their families. They were camped out at our power plants, camped out at our substations, camped out assuring that our equipment ran so that our customers could have a safe and enjoyable and warm holiday. Um, it's what we do a lot. And I care about those people and I care about our customers and that is, uh, I think, most important when you, especially you're transitioning, because people, you've all, we've all heard people don't know or care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. And for somebody who's brand new, and although I've been at Southern Company, again, I started in 1991, and I know a lot of people, I didn't know everybody at Georgia Power. Mm -hmm. And so they got to try to understand who I am and what I'm about, and um, I truly do care about what we do. Yes, Kim. So I want to say two things. Um, first of all, when Kim talked about uh, competence, um, I think you must have visited every operation in the state <laughs> when you took on this job. You were out there, boots on the ground, meeting the employees, and they were getting to know you, and they loved that. The second thing I would talk, say is when you talked about the change that we had to go through, right? Um, talk a little bit how you approach that because sometimes when you're having to shift the workforce, you know, we often just say, let's just cut here 20% here, 20% there. That was not your approach. You were very engaging and you approached it by looking at the work first, not the people. So talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, we looked across our entire business. It mm -hmm. wasn't just one part of the enterprise. Right. It was the recognition that we can get better in every single part of our business. Let's take a deeper dive and let's get the people who know the most about the business right. to really get together and um, be honest and open with each other about what we can do better, how we can either have a an more efficient process, how we can save money with what we do, how we can do some things um, using technology. And I will say part of what is also in our DNA, in addition to making the communities better because we're there, is a uh, laser focus on continued improvement. And so how can we use technology? How can we, I mean, we do more 
robust research and development than probably any other utility like us in the country. So it's look across our entire business. How can we all get better? This is not just um, about something that is focused on one part of the business, and it's not just people, but at the end of the day, it's about our customers. We spend your money, those of you who are Georgia Power customers, and I recognize that. And we've got to make sure that every dollar we're spending is as prudent as possible. And so it's about affordability. And we know that our rates have gone up recently. Um, we care. I've seen people. We used to have payment locations. Um, and I remember walking up uh, again in one of those visits. You've got to have a lot of energy, too. And I'm just blessed. Yes. Thank you. For, with a lot of energy to go a lot of places. And years ago, I walked into an office in America's Georgia, and there was a gentleman who had just walked in and looked a little disheveled and, was, and walked up to the counter, and he took money out of his pocket, money out of his pocket and his back, and said it was change and kind of wadded up bills. And he knew the woman behind the counter, and he said, Judy, this is all I have today. I'll be back tomorrow with some more. And I know that paying the power bill for a lot of people is, a, is hard. So that's really what we have got to make sure that we're thinking about. It's our customers and doing everything we can as effectively and as efficiently as we possibly can do it. And we should be doing that every day, and we do, but sometimes it is um, important that we go through a process to evaluate ourselves, and at the end of the day, we made a lot of changes and um, cut a lot of money out of our O&M budget. Great. Thank you, Kim. So a lot of us were reading about the increase in demand mm -hmm. for power, mm -hmm. right? A lot of the business growth in our state. And we've had to respond, Georgia Power has had to respond pretty quickly for a significant request for demand. How are you leading through that challenge? Because I know it's a challenge. Well, first of all, we have to all celebrate that Vogel Unit 4 came online last week. Woohoo! And for those of you who may not be as familiar with that journey, it's been a long, arduous journey to build the only two nuclear reactors that have been built from scratch in the last 30 years. And I want to also point out, and Neil Purcell is here, and I'm not sure where you're sitting. There you are. So Neil was on the Southern Company board uh, years ago when the decision was made to move forward with building units three and four at Vogel. And look, that happens in conjunction with our Public Service Commission. And the, we could spend an, actually an entire session just talking about um, perseverance and courage and making hard decisions that have the long-term benefit in mind. And um, I'm very thankful that there were a lot of very courageous people years ago who um, helped us to move forward and who have stood by us along the way. And of course, Betsy Higgins is here, CFO of Oglethorpe. And Oglethorpe and MEAG and the city of Dalton are our partners in the Vo all of the Vogel units. And look, we knew building units one and two, that was a hard journey. And we were ready for a hard journey, maybe not as hard as it turned out to be, which is the bankruptcy of our primary contractor, a global pandemic which impacted construction when we had 9,000 human beings in about the size of this room <laughs> um, constructing that plant. And we had to socially distance them and keep them on site. Um, look, our ability to navigate all of that um, is really second to none. And I say that, and it's, it's everybody here. Those of you in Georgia should feel very proud because the fact is that the state of Georgia right now is the envy of the country. Every other state which wishes they had clean, like what comes out of the stacks at Vogel is water vapor. There's no air emissions, no greenhouse gas, nothing comes out of the stack at Vogel. 24-7 reliability, you turn it on and it runs and runs and runs. It's affordable. Now it has a high capital cost, but a very low fuel cost. So over 60 to 80 years, which means that plant is gonna run beyond the year 2100, it is an economic option. So we did it. There were 24 units that were being um, uh, 
uh, oh gosh, the beginnings of the licensing process were happening at the same time for 24 units and only two finished, only two. And again, it takes a long-term view. And so this demand that's happening today, um, a lot of it is being drawn certainly to Georgia because we have a great business-friendly state, the best state to do business for 10 years in a row. And a lot of what these manufacturers want are um, certainly a great workforce and low-cost, reliable electricity. And we are able to provide it. Now, we are seeing growth that we haven't really seen in maybe decades since the early 70s. And in depending on what happens, it may even exceed that. So we are having to work quickly. We are having to do things much more quickly than we traditionally do. We go through a process with our Public Service Commission to put forth our 20-year plan. And just a couple of years ago, our 20-year 20, our 20 plan looked like we had very low load growth. Well, in 18 months, now it's like this. And so just being able to adjust and bring people together. Look, we are, I'm an engineer, so I can say this about engineers, we're very risk averse, and we're in a business where being very risk averse is the right way to be. Um, so we want to check and double check our work, um, but right now we're having to speed people up, and again, it's really about communicating why, and it's communicating how, and it's communicating that we've got your back and that we're all in this together, and let's go make this happen because this is a unique opportunity for Georgia and we want to uh, be able to serve every customer who comes to this state and uh, make sure that they have clean, safe, reliable, and affordable power. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So as you think about the future of energy in Georgia, paint a picture of that for us. What's your, what's your vision around that? So there... Again, as we think about this load that is growing and is, um, you know, there is a lot of manufacturing that's coming to Georgia. There are a lot of digital companies, data centers that are coming to Georgia, high energy consumers, and we need to be able to meet that growth. We're all beneficiaries of um, di the digital economy. And now with generative AI, those load demands are growing quickly with the desire to onshore much more manufacturing, those loads are growing quickly. And to be able to meet that, we have, and we've always had at our company, a very diverse portfolio of generation resources. So most people really don't know where power comes from, and today you all have learned there's nuclear power, but there is also coal, there's also natural gas, there's also hydro, and we have lots of hydro, there's solar, there's wind, there's batteries. Um, there are a diverse portfolio of assets that are all needed to serve the increasing and decreasing demands that we all take for granted every single day. And so you've got to have baseload resources, and nuclear is a great baseload, zero carbon resource. And I believe in this country, we are going to have to have more nuclear. There are 94 units in this country, many of which were built in the 60s and 70s, and their 60 to 80 year life will expire before 2050. So we've got to either relicense those, extend those to 100 years, which could happen, and build more nuclear. So nuclear has to be part of America's clean energy future. There will be some natural gas, and natural gas has half the CO2 that coal has. Um, Coal will, will eventually go away, um, but Southern Company, again, is doing research into carbon capture and utilization. We know more about s c carbon capture and sequestration than anybody in the country because we're, we run the research, the National Carbon Capture Research Center um, in Wilsonville, Alabama. And um, there are technologies that allow us to car capture carbon right now, but what do you do with the CO2? Do you put it in the ground? Do you put it in the ocean? Do you use it? Coca-Cola can only use so much. Um, but we're looking at other ways to use CO2. So, um, you know, natural gas will be around for a long time. Again, coal, probably not as long. Um, but right now we need it. And 
Georgia Power has lowered our CO2 emissions. We use a lot less coal than we once did. We've lowered our CO2 emissions by over 65% over the past decade and a half. Um, and then, yes, there'll be a lot of solar. And we already have a lot of solar in this state. We're ranked in the top 10 in terms of states across the country in the amount of solar generation that we have. And it's a wonderful part of our, our portfolio of resources. But on that winter morning, winter storm Elliot, in a, on a cold winter day, the sun is not shining yet at 6 and 7 a.m. when our load is peaking. So you can't always depend on the sunshine. And we were just very thankful that that day um, the sun was shining at all. So solar is a great resource, but it's just not reliable 24-7 or dispatchable. So it's an important part. The same with wind. Southern Company has looked for years at adding wind turbines off the coast of Savannah. That never really seems to work out, um, but we'll continue to look at that. But And batteries, you know, battery technology has come a long way, and it'll continue to evolve, and you need batteries to be able to store the energy that you produce during the day with either uh, solar or potentially wind. So all of those will be very important parts of our por portfolio for the future, and we'll work very constructively with our Public Service Commission to put out a plan that balances, again, clean, safe, reliable, and affordable. Wonderful. So I know you all have questions for Kim, so I've got one more, if I can. Um, so Kim, you know, one of the things that we talk a lot about is being a citizen where we serve, right? And um, Georgia Power does a lot in this state. Can you talk a little bit about I think it allows with your care, right? We care That's about right. our communities. Can you talk a little about what we're doing there in the community? Sure. So most of you who know somebody at Georgia Power probably know somebody like Misty Fernandez who works in our community in our external relations, knows somebody who's on one of your boards, knows somebody who is um, helping with a nonprofit or doing something um, you know, that, that is passion personally they have a passion for. And... That is truly in our DNA. One of our leaders in the early 1900s said that he believed Georgia Power had a responsibility to make communities better because we're there. And whether that's economic development, which we work very closely with. I know Pat Wilson's here. Welcome, Pat, to Rotary. Thank you. Um, I mean, our teams are working hard to attract new jobs, new investment to this state. Um, whether it's working with our mayors across the, the state, whether it's working with folks in education, I mean, we're, we're pretty much everywhere. And it's part of what we do. Not every utility does that, but it is in our DNA. All of our employees take that very seriously. We have a lot of volunteers. And um, anyway, it's really a privilege to be a part of it. So. So Thank Jan, you. Jan, I think we have time for some questions. I have so sure. I see Deepak has a question. Deepak? Yes. Thank you, Kim. That was, you gave us a comprehensive overview, but I have a follow-up question for you sure. on the balance between the increasing demand with the data centers and AI and cryptocurrency and the supply side. So on the supply side, you said we have to bring all of these different forms of energy production into the table. Um, what about distribution? And I'd love to see, I don't know if there's a chart, I'm sure you guys work on this, but if you project out the demand across the years and decades and what the production is gonna be from the various sources, and is the distribution gonna become the bottleneck or is the production the bottleneck? Do you need homes to have solar powers where they generate their own? Do you need partners in this process to, get, to make sure that we can balance the supply and demand? So it's, um, I think, all of the above, and I think you're right, so thank you for bringing that up. I mean, we do partner with a lot of our customers today. Certainly, if you want solar panels on your roof, you can do that. Um, we have a lot, of, um, a lot of customers, large industrial or large commercial customers who have backup generation that we can actually access. So all of that is part of our portfolio. And when it comes to distribution and transmission, so those are the wires, yes, those have to grow and expand as well. And there are technologies that are allowing sort of more electrons to flow through different types of conductor. And we are investing in that and we're upgrading our substations to improve reliability. So it's all of the above. Nothing is off the table. Um, 
I will say, so I, I did actually work for another company for a tiny little bit, and I came back. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Yeah, tiny. and uh, anyway, but <clears throat> the city of Bristol, Tennessee, for probably 50 years, has been able to access every home's water heater. And they sell water heaters that have a lot of insulation around them. And on the coldest mornings, they turn off everybody's water heater, but it's well insulated and it's got plenty of hot water for you, but that helps keep demand low. So all of these ideas are on the table and part of what our future holds. Another question, Tommy? Yeah, uh, yeah comment in a question. When you mentioned Plant Vogel, it made me remember about Alan, Alvin Vogel, his former CEO at Southern Company, and, and Courage. He was, as he told me one time when I knew him in business, escaped from a prisoner of war camp in Germany after several tries. And that's really courage and great inspiration for, for your company. <laughs> I have to comment on that. Yeah. I just said that to somebody in the room earlier. They were asking me how to pronounce Vogel, and I told them about Alvin Vogel, and you're exactly right. I mean, his um, this plant being named after him is actually quite meaningful because uh, he exhibited cur courage yeah. and perseverance until he got, got it right, and that's exactly yeah. what that plant has um, exhibited, yeah. and so that's a great connection. Good, uh, Thank just you. Just a brief question, then. You're uh, an element of your job is different in intensity from most people's. You've got a government partner. wonder if you comment about how you lead uh, in your company in making sure you've got the right connections in government. Well, look, we make sure that we've got connections with everybody that we do business with. And um, certainly we do work with the Department of Energy and Department of Defense. Um, and... Uh, Plant Vogel is a recipient of loan guarantees, uh, and, and so everybody is actually paying less for Plant Vogel than they might have otherwise, thanks to government loan guarantees. So I would just say that's it's an important part of, I think, everybody who has a business in here to have relationships with your stakeholders and partners, and certainly the federal government as a whole, all of the military bases in the state of Georgia, they are Georgia Power's largest customer. And so we work with them all the time to make sure that they are getting what they need from us in terms of reliable energy. We partner with them, just as I talked about with respect to um, accessing generation that might be on the base and ensuring that we can uh, provide that to our customers. So it's a it's really a shared energy economy when it comes to military and uh, the Department of Defense. So Kim, you talked about technology and innovation. There are a number of members of our club that are involved with technology companies and in, in innovation. How do you promote innovation in a large company like yours? And how should the people here that might want to be involved or have some suggestions for innovation, how do they go about communicating with you? Oh gosh, so we have so many ways. So. Um, Years, I mean, uh, let me think about this. It was in the 1960s, I think 1969, um, Alvin Vogel started, who, who's the namesake of the plant, started Southern Company's Research and Development Organization. And again, we invest more in proprietary research and development than any other company. So we, and we look really at applied research. So we partner with a lot of companies who have a technology and they want to try it out. We try to break it and make it better. So we can definitely partner with folks uh, through our research and development organization. We also work with venture capital and are investing in companies that are focused on the clean energy economy in the future. Um, that is through an organization called EIP, Energy Impact Partners. I can give anybody more information on that. We helped found that. It was us and a couple of other energy companies across the country. Uh, we are also involved something, in something here in the city called Engage, which is another venture capital organization focused on um, you know, supporting venture capital here in the city. So. Look, that is something that we are very focused on and care about, and there are a lot of windows and entrees into the work that we do. 
Thank you. I mentioned Engage. Blake Patton's here, too, and is, is uh, leading that initiative. So thank you. So many people have asked about, in the past, what happened in Texas? And this is not to be criti critical of Texas. What happened in Texas? Can it ever happen in Georgia? What's the answer? The answer is it's very, 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 very unlikely. I would never say no. I would never say it could never happen. Um, <clears throat> but it's very unlikely. And there's so many reasons for that. And it has to do with the market structure. Look, um, we've had a lot of courageous leaders at Southern Company. And 25 years ago, one of our courageous leaders, Alan Franklin, um, was testifying up in Washington, D.C. regularly as other parts of the country were deregulating their electricity markets because people felt that electricity should be traded like any other commodity. Um, and what has ended up happening in the state of Texas, and it's been hard to watch, honestly, for those of us who've kind of watched the, the, the train wreck happen. I hate to use that analogy, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> because we knew it was gonna be a very bad day. Um, and that market does not allow for long-term planning. It's all very short-term focused. And so what has happened in the state of Texas and in, even in California and up in New England, they are not building large baseload generating resources like we are here. Um, and so what has happened in the state of Texas, and it is horrible, but over 200 people died this winter before us, well, before Winter Storm Elliott, Winter Storm Uri, because people did not, there, were, there was just not enough assets on the ground. We have this constructive relationship with the Public Service Commission where we go through this process, we plan for 20 years, and we make decisions about how we're going to meet the needs of our customers today and set the path for 20 years from now. That doesn't exist in a lot of these deregulated markets anymore. And as I mentioned earlier about being the envy of the country, a lot of people wish they could put that genie back in the bottle and undo what they did. So look, I'm never gonna say that it, it's absolutely not gonna happen, but I can, it, it won't happen. It won't happen. So, so maybe it as a final happen. question, Kim, you pointed out these five C's of leadership and you talked about the importance of these within the organization. Many folks here, when we think about leadership, are thinking about how do we how do we communicate these kinds of leadership principles? Do we hire a coach? Do we have something unique about our culture? What have you done in order to be able to promulgate these three leadership principles within your organization? And is there a formal process, or is it more of a mentor mentee process? How would you describe it? Yeah, you know, it's really I think best done personally and leadership by example, and um, you know, walk in the talk, and then um, expecting that my team walks the talk and that their team walks the talk and holding people accountable. And that doesn't mean, look, I'm not saying, and in fact, I love that my team will debate. They disagree with me. They, I'm very, very coachable. And somebody can tell me that something I'm thinking is wrong. And I have learned that over the years, that that is the best thing you can have as a leader is somebody who will tell you the truth and in a very direct way, because we don't have time to kind of mess around. We got to just get right to it. So it's really about setting the expectations. We do talk about this. We have webinars quarterly. We talk about what's happening in the business. We highlight our employees, highlight what we call um, kind of the circle of life, which is the customers are at the center of everything we do. We talk about our values. And look, I'll just say that, in fact, I'm, I'm doing it. I did a commencement and I kind of hate to be a downer on these people's commencement, but one of the very last pieces of advice, was anybody at Georgia Tech on Friday morning when I was there? Okay, so it was kind of a downer, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but my last piece of advice was check your moral compass regularly, and it's really about business ethics. Um, and I am, look, I lived through Enron. I lived, I worked at a subsidiary, I ended up being a company that was spun off that I used to say was a lot like Enron, we don't have any crooks. I can't say that now. So you've got to walk the talk. It's not just words on a page, but it's how you live, it's how you communicate, it's how your team lives and communicates that matters. Because um, you can have words on a page that mean absolutely nothing. It's really about what you do every day, how you communicate, how you show up, 
how you hold people accountable, and, and then it all just kind of works. Kim, I want to thank you. I also want to recognize some of your folks. If, if you're a member, yeah, please, Southern uh, please Company stand. family, please stand up. Yeah, there are a bunch of you hand, here. Kim, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Neil. Kim, thank you for those outstanding leadership lessons, and we appreciate everything you do in keeping the power and the lights lights on. Uh, I will just also mention again, next Monday, no meeting here. We have our membership cocktail party at the Botanical Gardens. Great weather is predicted. May 20th, generative AI, topic that Kim just talked about, importance to our community. Meeting adjourned.